Uh, so we've now, uh, we're now going on to a second group of countries, uh, Vanuatu, Tonga, and Samoa. And uh, we once again uh, are very privileged to have uh, leading uh, policy makers and advisors uh, to uh, tell us uh, about latest developments in those three countries. Uh, for Vanuatu, we have Otto Tevi. Uh, many of you will know Otto, he's a frequent visitor uh, here and is the governor of the Reserve Bank of uh, Vanuatu. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Joyce Murphy, and we have, so is, who is the governor for the National Reserve Bank of Tonga. So we're, we're very fortunate to have two governors uh, here on this panel. And then our third speaker is uh, Kolone Vai, who is now the co-managing director at KVA Consult Limited Samoa. Many of you will know him as a former finance secretary in Samoa and one of the leading advisors to the governments and probably the architect of a lot of economic reforms in Samoa. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, Ten minutes each. And uh, Otto, you're first. And you've got a PowerPoint. Well, firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank ANU for this important event. Uh, as a central bank governor, uh, my, my presentation will be biased towards economics. Uh, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about politics. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I'll be talking about the Vanuatu's uh, macroeconomic situation and prospect. And with the interest of uh, time, I'll be uh, rushing my presentation. Well, after independence in 1980 and in the last two decades of independence, the, the, the economy was we're not really growing that fast. And in fact, the two decades we were stagnating. And this is basically because we were uh, uh, having, establishing a new nation and trying to build a new nation. So that's the, the challenges that we've been going through. And in the 1990s, we were going through a lot of political instabilities. And this was the first time that we had uh, 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 coalition governments and uh, numerous uh, political changes. So our attention was more on the, on the, on the politics rather than on, on the economy. And as, as, and as a result, in 19, 1997, the government uh, decided to adopt a, a comprehensive reform program under the uh, auspices of the Asian Development Bank. Now, as a result of these reforms, uh, in, since 2003 and 2008, uh, the economy was growing at an average rate of 6%. And this was part of the reforms. And there are also other reforms that contributed to this growth. Uh, one of these reforms is the, the telecommunication sector. So we, we removed the monopoly and we introduce new uh, competitors into the industry. And as, as a result, the prices have come down. And also, we, we, uh, we, we introduced the open sky policy and invited other airlines to come in. And these have increased the number of uh, tourism in the country. And these are some of the factors that have contributed to this high economic growth. But also, at that, at that time, we also were lucky because the world economy was performing really well before the financial crisis. And we had Australia, which was performing well. And our, our tourism was mainly dependent on tourism. So 60% of our tourists comes from, from Australia. And also our real estate uh, sector was performing well. And it was also due to demand from uh, Australian investors. Now, in 2009 and 2010, the, the, the economy dipped. And one of the well, one of the reasons is that one of the reasons for this, for this dip is the lacking impact of the uh, global financial crisis. So the global financial crisis hit us later. So the, the global crisis started in 2008. But 2008 and 2009, we were really doing well. And 2010, 2010, we were affected by, by some of the impacts of this crisis. But not only that, there were also, because we, our reliance on tourism, 
Uh, there were also aggressive competitors in the market, and we had Fiji and Cook Islands where we're aggressively marketing. So we, we, our market cannot, our economy cannot uh, compete with uh, uh, some of the discounted market uh, abroad. So that, that's really affecting our, our services sector. And our service sector is, is, is a, has a major contribution to, to our economy. Now, that's basically our, our growth story on, on, on the graph. And, and as, as you can see, in the next few years, we're expecting the economy to grow again. But I'll come back to that in the next uh, a few minutes. Now, firstly, if you look at this graph, you, you will notice that the potential output is always positive. And in some years, we were growing above that uh, potential. And in some years, we were growing below that potential. But the potential was always around, it's always around 5%. Now, in terms of the medium-term outlook, in the next few years, in 2013 and 2015, we're, we're expecting to, the, uh, the economy to rebound again. And one of the main reasons is that the services sector is now showing signs of rebounding, and especially the tourism sector, as we are seeing we are experiencing this year. And also, the next five years, there will be major public sector projects, and, and the total cost is in excess of 200 million Australian dollars. And this is huge in terms of my role as governor to sterilize the, 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 the money that is flowing into the economy. And the other optimism is the private sector investment is starting to pick up. We had a lot of, uh, we have new uh, huge uh, projects that are coming in, uh, especially on the tourism side. So things are, are looking good in terms of the private sector. And the macro, macroeconomic fa fundamentals are still strong. Our, our official reserves are around six months of import cover. And our inflation is low. So, so these are our official reserves. And our, our, our inflation is, it's around 2 to 3 percent. So, so it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, good, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, record that we've uh, achieved. Now, in 2006 and 2010, we had a pretty good uh, fiscal development. We had uh, budget surpluses, uh, but around 2009, 2010, 11, uh, we started moving into a fiscal deficit. And, and that could be a risk in the future if we are not uh, managing that uh, properly. So it could pose a macroeconomic threat and could destabilize the macroeconomic stability that we've enjoyed. But I note in the government's uh, recent speech, uh, recent statement, that they want to resort to uh, a balanced budget and a surplus budget in the, in the next future. But currently, uh, we'll have to wait until the next government to make a new commitment because our government currently is in a, in a caretaker mode because the next, uh, in end of October, we are going to the polls. Now, some risk facing our economy. One is the global economic situation. As you know, the, the situation in Europe and the US also is not really, uh, they're still uh, dragging behind. Although the, uh, the, 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 the chairman of the Federal Reserve is thinking of another uh, quantitative easing. But, but Australia, and our economy will, will depend on Australia and China. And as we see, China is all, also feeling the impacts of the, what's happening in Europe. So that could affect maybe Australia, and that could affect the rest of the Pacific. And, and Fanatu will be dependent, especially on how Australia is performing, uh, because we are, we are dependent on, on our tourism. Uh, but our, our recent experience have shown that uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, our tourism numbers have re reached record levels. So, so, so maybe if there's another crisis, that could be the same. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Now, so the, the global economic situation, and then the other thing is the need for fiscal discipline. Uh, 
that needs to be there. And then further institutional and economic reforms. A good, gover good governance is important because going towards election, now we have a lot of political parties, and our test will be uh, uh, out, out, our, ma our main test will be how we organize ourselves in the face of this fragmentation. Now, let me go to my conclusion. Well, the world economy is still facing a challenge. But I believe if we do certain things right, the economy will, will continue to grow. And I, and, I, and I am optimistic that the economy will grow in the next few years. The macroeconomic fundamentals are still strong, and we need to manage our fiscal uh, uh, challenge as well. Uh, the, the other issue is, despite this economic growth, uh, our, our main challenge is to translate this into development outcomes. And we, we might not be able to achieve a millennium development goal target by 2015. And the other challenge is for broad-based growth. Broad-based growth remains a bigger challenge, maybe not only in, the, in Vanuatu, but in other Pacific Island countries as well. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks very much, Otto, for covering such a broad range and very succinctly. Uh, Joyce, over to you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon to you all. I've been asked to uh, give you a quick update on the Tongan economy. Economic growth in Tonga has been relatively slow. It has averaged at just a little above 1% in the past decade. Having said that, in the last three years, economic growth has been recorded at over 2%, and in 2010 11, it recorded a 4.7% growth. This growth has been supported by aid-funded constructions. With those aid-funded supports expected to wane, Tonga's economic growth is projected to grow at a much lower rate. So the flow-on effect from, this, from the 4.7 growth has been minimal in terms of flowing on to the population or the rest of the economy. Basically, Tonga is still struggling with the impact of GFC. Private remittances has fallen by 100 million since 2008, an equivalent of about 15% of GDP. At the same time, exports has fallen by some 20 million. So you can imagine the impact of this large amount of money out of the country in this period of time, the impact on private individuals, business community, the banking system, and government itself. However, tourism has risen in this past few years, and it is showing potential to support economic growth in the medium to the long term. In terms of external stability, external stability in Tonga has been maintained and supported by develop, development partners assistance. So consequently, liquidity in the banking system is not a constraint to economic activity. However, credit growth is still negative and therefore not supporting economic activity for Tonga. The fiscal position is a challenge, with public debt at around 45% of GDP. And of course, government is well aware of this situation and is managing it together with the support of development partners. Inflation has fallen in recent months, thanks to the slight decline in the price of oil, world oil, um, world oil prices, and the favorable weather condition that has supported domestic production of food supply. So with that summary, what are the economic challenges that Tonga is facing? There are many, but I will highlight five of them. Raising actual and potential economic growth is a big challenge for Tonga. Not easy, given all the factors that you're well aware of. Uh, 
being far away, small, you know, from our markets, all those uh, factors that you, did you know. Another challenge is reducing the public debt position when demand for public spending are significant. How can we grow the economy? Uh, previous presenter referred to you know, cutting expenditure uh, at the same time trying to uh, promote economic activity. Maintaining the foreign exchange reserves level when the donor support wanes off. So this is a key constraint or challenge and issue for the Reserve Bank. Um, maintaining external stability when this high level of uh, donor support uh, starts to decline. Building a diverse and dynamic industrial base in the face of declining remittances. As you all know, remittances has propped up the economy for so long, but as we have learned, we cannot continue to rely on remittances. Um, the last key economic challenge I'd like to touch on is building and maintaining the momentum of economic reforms. Former Minister of Finance and Governor this morning uh, referred to uh, uh, public economic reforms started back in early 2000. So we have to continue that momentum despite the challenges and the difficulties that we are facing. So facing these economic challenges, not going to be easy as mentioned. So we are facing some key downside risks for Tonga in terms of addressing these challenges. We cannot do this on our own. There are slower economic growth around at our trading partners and the economies of our trading partners. US, Australia, New Zealand. So we are kind of dependent on the economic growth in these um, countries. Oil prices, it's trending upwards, so that's going to be a, a key challenge for us. We have started to look into alternative um, energy source, so it's a big issue for the country, and we also are receiving support from development partners, many of you sitting in this room, uh, on developing uh, that site. Higher food prices, particularly from New Zealand, because we import most of our food supplies from New Zealand. Some from Australia, but not as high as from New Zealand. There is a downside risk that the debt position of government might worsen. So again, the fiscal position and fiscal space to stimulate the economy is a downside risk for us. And of course, God-given natural disasters. We are prone to natural disasters, climate change, all of those that will become a big issue in terms of us addressing these key economic challenges for Tonga. So basically, that's what I have to say about the Tongan economy. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I am looking forward to learning from you on how to address these key economic challenges. Malo. Oh, well, thanks very much, Joyce. I think we're particularly uh, starved of information about Polynesia, so it's fascinating to get that account of Tonga. And now over to you, Colonial Samoa. Well, I, I, I could have, she could have described the Samoan economy by the way she was going through, but. I, I'll still try and, and, and sort of do, do justice to the 10 minutes that have been given. Essentially, the Samoan economy has cooled down a lot in the last uh, three years. Um, it made major strides in, in the early part of the 2000 decade. And then the global crisis, I guess everyone got hit with that. And then we also had the tsunami in 2009. And those are the two key sort of events that have really uh, given a, a, a huge shock to the, the economy in Samoa. And in 2009, we had a, the, the economy contracted by 5%. Um, the last two years, we haven't been able to catch up with that. We are hoping that maybe by the end of uh, this year, we'll be able to get back to the 2008 
uh, situation. So it's it's a it's a very sort of challenging time for for the, the economy in Samoa. Uh, in terms of of uh, of the the focus of my presentation, I, I guess the, the 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 pamphlet that was circulated tried to highlight the the sustainability of the uh, the budget deficit, and I guess I'm going to try and, and explain why is it nine percent of GDP, which is way outside of the, the official target of three and a half percent. But I, I hope I will be able to sort of explain that. It's a one-off sort of situation because of these two major events that the government tried to, to respond to. Because in 2007, 2008, it came up with a major stimulus sort of package. I guess Obama was doing it then. Our minister thought it was a good thing also. But it, it, we thought at the time it was a, it was a very good uh, response. Uh, to try and keep the economy moving. But unfortunately, in 2009, the following year, the, the tsunami hit, and that created a lot of uh, dislocation, particularly with the, the tourism industry that we were relying upon. Um, tourism is the biggest money earner for Samoa now. Uh, it's, it's, it's very close to remittances now. It's, it's, those are the two main sources of foreign exchange. And prospects for, for those two er in those two areas are, are not very bright. Uh, in tourism, uh, we used to get a lot of Australians. We don't know what happened. Um, it just disappeared. At the time when we, were, we entered into a uh, low-cost so airline with the, the Virgin Group, um, we thought we were on to a very good uh, sort of plan because all of a sudden, a lot of Australians were coming to Samoa. And I guess it was at a time that there was the Bali bombing and people were looking elsewhere. But that's how we're trying to rationalize it now. And then New Zealand, thanks to, to the New Zealand market, it's the, now it's, it, that's the biggest market that we have in, for tourism. But because also the New Zealand market is, is, is softening and almost sort of on the verge of, of uh, declining, we're, we're, we're quite vulnerable in the tourism area. Now, there's very little in terms of traffic coming from the Northern America and the European market. So we've, it's, the tourism sector is very narrowly based. Now, if I come to the to to the uh, to the macro uh, picture, as I said, um, GDP um, declined by five percent, and it's the last three years is still below five percent. So, as I said it's, it's, it will take maybe another twelve months before we catch up. In terms of the, the fiscal side, uh, just to give you an indication of the, the magnitude, and I guess that's why uh, Stephen sort of, sort of touched on the sustainability of this, because in terms of uh, uh, the budget deficits, in 2008 was 3%, 2009 was 4%. Then they pumped money to the, the economy and, and moved the deficit to uh, seven, and then moved up to to nine now. Now, for those who are in this public finance uh, area, the, the 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 usual rule of thumb is to try and keep below three and a half percent. And I guess that's why the government had came up with this uh, uh, policy target. Even in the latest policy document in the 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 strategy or development. For 2012 to 2016, it has still come out with a 3.5% target. And yet, we are seeing this 9% in 2012. Now, the question is, is that a realistic one to, to aim for? I've gone through the figures. In terms of the, the latest budget deficit, I thought when, you, when I went through it, 
the impact is not as bad as one would think in terms of inflation and all of that, because the budget deficit has basically been funded from concessionary borrowings, because it's all linked back to the development programs that came in for rehabilitation for the, the tsunami. Even with the domestic borrowings, so that the government has shifted the focus onto the non-banks. In terms, you know, they, they basically are trying to borrow from the, the provident funds, the, the accident compensation funds, the pension funds. So essentially, one could say the non-inflationary. So in terms of an impact on inflation, that, that uh, looks to be a sound approach. And when you look at the, the, the inflation, situation in Samoa, it has come down and it's averaging at four to five percent. In terms of the, the external sector, it has actually become very strong in terms of reserves. Reserves have moved from four to, to even six, equivalent of six months of imports. Uh, and this is really because there's been massive inflow of aid for the rehabilitation uh, programs. But it's in this sector that I think that we have the vulnerability in Samoa, uh, really because if you look at the, the, the tourism side, it's not looking good. In remittances, as Mafia said, we, we have a very similar sort of situation. Uh, if you look at the, the current account deficit, it's in terms of GDP, it's actually double. So it, it's, it's not a very good sign. So it's in the external sector, which I think will be, there will be more vulnerability for the Samoan economy. Recently, with my friend, uh, there's been a, a paper out by the IMF on the exchange rate. And no one can, can deny that. The, the, the TALA has appreciated in real terms by 12, maybe 15 percent. So in terms of the, the external sector, there, there are some, some, some signs that would make people a lot more concerned if they're not resolved very quickly. In terms of the external debt, um, there's been a, a massive increase in, in external debt. But this is mainly because of the, the Chinese construction programs that have come in, and they're quite prominent in, in, in Samoa now. Um, the, in terms of the, the, the government policy, uh, the external debt should be about 50% of GDP. When you look at the figures, it's actually moved to 63%. But then, when you look into the details, into the net present value, it's actually below uh, about 45%. Because the bulk of Samoa's external debt are on concessionary terms. So it, it, external debt, there could be a problem. But because of the concessionary nature, it's, it, it appears manageable. The, 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 the issue comes in because when Samoa is actually going to graduate out of the LDC status um, in 2014, and when that happens, people are expecting the terms of borrowings are supposed to be a lot more sort of semi-commercial to commercial. So this is an issue that I guess, I guess for those who are looking at the, the external debt for Samoa would be a, a worrying issue also. Another issue in terms of the external debt, because of the, 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 the significant amount of, of debt that's now denominated in uh, Chinese currency, the Chinese currency is, I guess publicly everyone says it's, it's, it's uh, undervalued. Now, so there is a, a major ex a currency exposure even though there, there, there's a, supposed to be an understanding that some of this debt could be uh, written off 
or could be made a lot more softer. The fact is, as long as there, there are no hedging uh, arrangements in place, there is a major currency exposure there. I guess not just for Samoa, because I know that a number of other Pacific Island countries have also taken advantage of this opportunity to, to borrow from, from the People's Republic of China to build buildings and gymnasiums. I'm not criticizing that. All I'm saying is that this is the, the situation and the exposure that you get if you go down that path. Okay. In terms of, 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 of challenges, I think it's in really in the external sector. Domestically, I think we, there are some issues in terms of the traditional and modern government, uh, uh, modern governance systems are being tested, even to the extent there are some tensions in, in, in terms of events flaring up between the central government and, and the village uh, authorities. But I, I'm, I'm confident that, that is, there is enough sort of uh, understanding and also a norm for using the rule of law to address those systems. Um, I guess I can stop there and then I can elaborate on any other issues that will, may come up. Thank you.